Lorraine Niedecker in Word and Music by Jeffrey Wagner. Lorraine writes, the flood is subsiding and maybe the monsoon has passed. The birds and animals came close, particularly inside the house because on two sides, I only had a couple of feet of land. A flood in the summer here is like a tropical jungle. Here a large and very fat muskrat swam and came out on shore to sun himself and I had two turtles on my mud flat. I can't be sure of the difference between their noises and bullfrogs, but I think it's turtles that have that deep thing always three times from evening till two in the morning. Living in the teeming tropics under jungle law, I wasn't surprised one morning to find two blood spots on my cement steps and not far away, a decapitated young rabbit. Chopin is much too delicate for this country, but not for beautiful moonlit nights.
Before Jeff's performance from Chopin's Nocturne in E flat major, we heard a passage from a letter written by Laurie Niedecker in August of 1950 to Louis Zukowski. In that letter, we sense her delight in the contrast of ravaging nature with rarefied art. In this case, the refined music of Chopin. Throughout much of Lorraine's correspondence with poet Louis Zukowski, her mentor and longtime correspondent, and Sid Corman, her literary executor, we find references to music and to her increasing fascination with classical music especially. Her neighbor on Blackhawk Island, Aeneas McAllister, played the piano and was especially instrumental in introducing Lorene to the music of the masters. The McAllisters, like many of us in the 1950s, developed a collection of LPs, long playing records, which they often played for Lorene. Her interest in Zukovsky's son, the violin prodigy Paul Zukovsky, also seemed to have sharpened her appetite for music. It may have even enhanced a musical dimension of her written work. As Lorene's correspondence with Zukovsky, Corman, and others reveals, her constantly absorbent and inquiring mind covered much territory. There is hardly a great thinker or literary figure in Western civilization not mentioned in her letters, and we should not be surprised if her mind turned its bright beam on the art of music at times. The name of Beethoven comes up several times. And in these words, written to Zukovsky in 1954, she affirms her passion for the music of Beethoven. I've taken a sudden liking to Beethoven, she wrote. Give me a Beethoven piano concerto and I'll drop everything and all systems of thought for its duration. Beethoven, like Lorene, was a great lover of nature. He preferred the outskirts of his hometown of Vienna to its inner city. And it's interesting that Lorene, who also preferred the countryside to the city, was drawn to his music. Beethoven's music, like Lorene's poetry, reflects both small and huge forces in nature, from its teeniest elements to its superhuman forces. Blackhawk Island was certainly her preferred laboratory for such observation and experience. She wrote of an especially poignant moment involving Beethoven's music on her 51st birthday. On leaving McAllister's, nice birthday supper there for me, and I was presented with a box of candy tied with a sprig of real flowers, almond, I think, and all of them so lovely. We played Beethoven on Aeneas's phonograph. I walked home in the moonlight twice past my place before going in, and stood in my backyard, shadows of trees almost all leafed out, lazy frog sounds and not a sweet scent, but a nice smell in the air that might be from the orchard across the river. I'm happy, though 51.
Lorene had music on at least one other birthday, that of 1957 when she wrote, the McAllisters ordered fish suppers from a nearby tavern to eat at their house and planted me before a tall cardboard box with Steinbach, Germany, written all over it. As I moved the box, I heard a tinkle and knew what it was, a music box. But it wasn't a box, just a tall, highly decorated pink and blue and yellow thing, the top of which goes round as the music plays Brahms' lullaby. A nice little tinkly tune. My interest in music boxes is enormous, but half the pleasure is the box. Some highly polished, beautiful little boxes I've seen. You wind it up, and that serves for nine playings. But at the end of each play, it stops with a click until you raise the little go-ahead gadget. Lorreen seems to have also been strongly drawn to the music of the great Polish composer Frédéric Chopin, as his name comes up several times in her correspondence. In a 1953 letter, she wrote, Friday night we played Chopin records at McAllister's, and when it came to Chopin waltzes, we danced. Families are wonderful.
Lorraine wrote another time of her enthusiasm for Chopin, after hearing his music on several new records brought over by Aeneas. One recording contains some of Chopin's fearsome etudes. Of that music she wrote, Oh, how exquisite! There need not be anything else in the world for me. Just let me have a phonograph before I turn my body and soul to the county. Although the exact contents of this recording are not known, it may have included Chopin's delicate etude in A-flat, the Aeolian harp etude. This etude represents in music the sound of a harp being played not by fingers, but simply by the sound of the wind blowing over the strings. Lorraine also mentioned her love for Beethoven's great Kreutzer violin and piano sonata. We do not have a violin today, but we'll end with a performance from another work of Beethoven, his Rondo in C major. We thank you for coming today and celebrating the legacy of Laurie Niedecker, her love for both the spoken and written word and the wordless art of music.